Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series for the months of October, November, and December of 2015 is on the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, remember, lived at a very difficult time as the country of Judah, as it was called in those days, was gradually being dismembered and taken apart by the Babylonian forces, and finally Jerusalem was destroyed and left in a, as a heap of rubble. Jeremiah lived through all of that. And so in this particular lesson, we're going to focus on the actual final destruction of Jerusalem before the Babylonian exile. This is lesson number 10 in that series for December 5 of 2015. I hope you have your Bible handy so you can check on us to make sure we're quoting the scripture correctly, but meanwhile, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we pray. Our wonderful Father, we come before you once again as a class and as friends to talk about you, to think about the awful experience of the people who lived in, Jer in Jerusalem at the end of their independent ministry and their independent kingdom. They never again had rose to the same power that they had had before that time. And Jeremiah, what can we say about him? Be with us now as we talk about him and about the others who were involved. May we uh, come to know you better through their experiences is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we mentioned in the prayer, uh, we're going to talk about the final events that led up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Remember, Daniel and his friends were in Babylon. Ezekiel was somewhere south of Babylon, but in Babylonia, the larger territory of Babylon, uh, as an exile with a whole group of, of, of Jewish people lived over there. And Jeremiah is still back in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is being sieged. Jerusalem was sieged for about two and a half years, and things got so bad that people were actually eating their dead relatives and their dead children because they had nothing else to eat. That final destruction occurred probably in July or August of 586 B.C. So, <clears throat> Ellen White has these words to say about that time. Within a few short years, the king of Babylon was to be used as the instrument of God's wrath upon impenitent Judah. Okay, God is using what? The king of Babylon. Is it all right for God to use a pagan king as an instrument? Well, he stopped protecting them from what they would have probably done if they had the opportunity, and they took the opportunity when it came about. Because again and again, Jerusalem was to be surrounded and entered by the besieging armies of Nebuchadnezzar. Company after company, at first a few only, but later on thousands and tens of thousands were to be taken captive to the land of Shinar, which is another name for Babylon, there to dwell in enforced exile. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, all these Jewish kings were in turn to become vassals of the Babylonian ruler. He set each one of those guys up. And then what happened? They rebelled against him and he hauled them off to Babylon. Later they were to rebel. Severer and yet more severe chastisements were to be inflicted upon the rebellious nation until at last the entire land was to become a desolation. Jerusalem was to be laid waste and burned with fire. The temple that Solomon had built was to be destroyed and the kingdom of Judah was to fall, never again to occupy its former position among the nations of the earth. Prophets and Kings 4.22 and 4.23. So what were the events, what was it that actually led to that final demise of Jerusalem? Um, let's look for a few minutes at Ezekiel 8. On the fifth day of the sixth month of the sixth year of our exile. Now this is, this is Ezekiel writing from over near Babylon. The leaders of the exiles from Judah were sitting in my house with me. Suddenly the power of the sovereign Lord came on me. I looked up and saw a vision of a fiery human form. From the waist down his body looked like fire. and From the waist up he was like shining polished bronze. I would think shining polished bronze and fire would look pretty much the same. Anyway. He stretched out what seemed to be a hand and seized me by the hair. Shall I, shall I try that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we... Then in, his, in this vision, God's Spirit lifted me high in the air and took me to Jerusalem. He took me to the inner entrance of the north gate of the temple where there was an idol 
that was an outrage to God. So here at the north temple, north gate of the temple, there's a big old idol. Then I, there I saw the dazzling light that shows the presence of Israel's God, just as I had seen it when I was by the river Kibar. God said to me, mortal man, look towards the north. I looked, and there near the altar, by the entrance of the gateway, I saw the idol that was an outrage to God. I was another one. God said to me, mortal man, do you see what is happening? Look at the disgusting things the people of Israel are doing here, driving me farther and farther away from my holy place. You will see even more disgraceful things than this. He took me to the entrance of the outer court, courtyard and showed me a hole in the wall. He said, mortal man, break through the wall here. I broke through it, found a door. He said to me, go in and look at the evil, disgusting things that they're doing here. So I went in and looked. Now remember, all of this is happening in the temple compound, in Solomon's temple compound. This is not some far off place in another part of Jerusalem or another part of the country. This is in the courtyard and in the temple of, of Solomon. The walls were covered with drawings of snakes and other unclean animals and of the other things which the Israelites were worshiping. Seventy Israelite leaders were there, including Jeazaniah, son of Shaphan, someone he even knew by, by sight. Each one was holding an incense burner, and smoke was rising from the incense. God asked me, mortal man, do you see uh, what the Israelite leaders are doing in secret? They are all worshiping in a room full of images. Their excuse is, the Lord doesn't see us. He has abandoned the country. That's crazy. Then the Lord said to me, you're going to see that them do even more disgusting things than that. So he took me to the north gate of the temple and showed me women weeping over the death of the god Tammuz. What is, what's going on with the god Tammuz? Anyone know about Tammuz? What kind, what kind of a god is that that can die? Fertility. It's a fertility god that died every fall as the plants turned green and dead and arose again every spring when the green came out again. So they believed this god was the responsible for the fertility. He asked, mortal man, do you see that? You will see even more disgusting things. So he took me to the inner court of the temple. There near the entrance of the sanctuary between the altar and the passage were about 25 men. So here they are at the gate of Solomon's temple. And what are they doing? They turn their backs to the sanctuary and were bowing low towards the east, worshiping the rising sun. The Lord said to me, mortal man, do you see that? These people of Judah are not satisfied with merely doing all the disgusting things you have seen here and with spreading violence throughout the country. No, they must come and do them here in the temple itself and make me even more angry. Look how they insult me in the most offensive way possible. They will feel all the force of my anger. I will not spare them or show them any mercy. They will shout prayers to me as loud as they can, but I will not listen to them. So if you were God, what would you do with people like that? <laughs> Let them go. Yeah. That's about all he could do. They don't want to listen. Yeah. Thomas was actually a fertility cult god from Babylonia being carried on, uh, on in, in this case, inside this emphasis of Solomon's temple. Well, <clears throat> look especially at Ezekiel 8, 12. We just read that. Let me read it again. God asked me, mortal man, do you see what the Israelite leaders are doing in secret? They are all worshiping in a room full of images. Their excuse is the Lord doesn't see us. He has abandoned the country. Wow. What do you suppose would lead them to say well, that? Wasn't that a, <laughs> well, that's what I was going to that's what I was going to say. It wasn't that a pretty accurate assessment. Yeah. It seemed like it. I mean, they had been overrun twice by Babylonians already, right? There are, there are Jews today who, specifically since World War II, have kind of abandoned their faith because they feel, it's my understanding, very similar. You know, it's, it's how could God? How could our mm -hmm. God have allowed the Holocaust to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a thing on television yesterday where this Jewish around the LA area, people brought like hundreds of chickens, and this Jewish rabbi was standing outside cutting their head off, and people were they called the police. It was a big brouhaha. I was surprised, and he was doing what people could see. They were just people were paying him, and he was just cutting. I mean, 
I don't know what's and going they, on they anymore. They taking the chickens back again. What were they doing with them? I don't know. He was throwing them, and police came, and everybody had signs, and yelling. They said, oh, you go to McDonald's. This is religion. <laughs> it's weird. Things are getting stranger wow. by the minute. Well, the question is, did they really think that these pagan gods were going to do something for them? Well, tragedy. I figured, what can it hurt? <coughs> so the, just the, long, just the God long. that's supposed to be on our side doesn't seem to be. You know, we we often say in here, and we're 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 going to take this tact here, this during this broadcast to say that um, people have abandoned God, so He has to. You know, he has to, he has to, you know, kind of leave. There's nothing he can do for them. He has to leave them. Are are we saying? Are we saying that's what happened to the Jews during World War II? Well, there's a very interesting passage in Romans one. I wish I had time to read it all and discuss it, but it discusses God's anger. Romans one, starting with verse 18. I'm going to start down with verse 22, where it starts to describe God's anger. It says. <laughs> They say they are wise, but they are fools. Instead of worshiping the immortal God, they worship images made to look like mortal human beings or birds or animals or reptiles. Isn't that what the Jews were doing? And so God has given those people over to do the filthy things their hearts desire. Now this is one of the best descriptions, probably the best description of God's anger in the whole Bible. He says God's angry. What does he do? He gives up on them. They do shameful things with each other. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve what God has created instead of the Creator Himself, who is to be praised forever. Amen. Because they do this, God has given them over to shameful passions. I mean, we're talking about worshiping fertility cult gods and carrying on with male and female prostitutes and all that kind of stuff. So is, is this what happens to anybody at any time who when you when these bad things happen to you is that's what's happening well but what's happened here if you, if you read through the bible and you look for places where it talks about god's anger and so forth you find out again and again and again many times in the old testament and in the new testament when god gets quote angry or his, pours out his wrath he lets people go and you look at the context it's because they have gone as far away from God as they could go, and they're running the other direction as fast as they can go, and finally God just says, well, what else can I do? I understand that, but my, my question is, every time, every time bad things happen to you, is that, oh, no. is that, is that no. the situation? I think, no. I mean, think about this, okay? Let's just assume that we're all good, faithful followers of God here. I certainly believe we are. But in, in, in whatever. What would what would you think would be Satan's primary attack on who would he like to get after most of all? How do I but then God's how people. do I know the difference? We got an example. That's Job one and two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Job chapter one and two. Well, that was kind of special and <laughs> but how how do I know how do I know the difference? How do I know? I mean it's logical for somebody to whom misfortune and disaster falls upon to think um you know, I, there must be something that I have done or haven't done, and, and therefore, therefore God is, is not able to help me or something. So how, how, do, I, how, do, we, how do we know the differences? So, well, the question is, how do you respond to that? Do you turn back to God and say, please help me, or do you run even faster away from Him? That's the question. And that's why Job is such a good example, because yeah. he did right even just because it was right even after the fact. And it was declared right from the beginning bef that well, when by God that he was righteous, that yeah. he was a righteous man. Yeah. And then he had his family tell him, hey, you mu it's obvious you must have done something wrong. Look yeah. at you. Yeah. You know, exactly. and, and, and talk about uh, he, no, no moral support. Or, uh, yeah. uh, well, who was the king of the last king of Judah? Anybody remember? Zedekiah, easy to remember. His name starts with a Z, right? Well, most of those other guys started with J's. Zedekiah, the last of the sons of Josiah, his father was the good king Josiah. He was the last king to rule in Jerusalem and the last king on the throne of Judah before its destruction by the Babylonians. 
He was placed on that throne by Nebuchadnezzar himself in 598-597. Vassal, was that a vassal king? Is that what it they call him? a vassal king, yeah. Okay. At first he apparently was willing to listen to instruction from God, but he very quickly abandoned that attitude. So, Nebuchadnezzar had been completely frustrated by the behavior of the Jewish people and especially the king he had placed on the throne. Zedekiah, instead of remaining loyal to Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, here's the man who put him on the throne and said, I'm with you, just obey your, do what you're supposed to, pay your taxes, I'll support you. What does he do? He turns and thinks that maybe the Egyptians can get him out of this thing, so he, 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 he starts sending his, his taxes to Egypt. Well, when Nebuchadnezzar surrounded Jerusalem at the beginning of that final siege, the Egyptian army started marching north, and Nebuchadnezzar's army temporarily abandoned Jerusalem to face the Egyptians. Now, do we know anything about, for all of you history gurus, do we know anything about Egypt versus Nebuchadnezzar before, earlier? They had a, was a, with Josiah out there? Well, he, he, the Egyptians tried to go north, yeah. but when they got further north, just their, his father, Zedekiah's father, lost his life by opposing the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. But the Egyptians went on far, farther north, and the Babylonians came out and just completely wiped them out. I mean, they, the Egyptians didn't have a ghost of a chance against and them. And they Babylon. came around from the north, didn't they? So they, is that some reference to the king of the north? Because yeah. if you went due east or came due west, yeah. it's miserable conditions yeah. out there. Well, when the Babylonians left Jerusalem temporarily to go and, and stop the Egyptians, Zedekiah thought, right, great, we're going to make, we're going to succeed, and so forth. Which, of course, was complete nonsense. And Jeremiah just pleaded with them, please, please, Babylon is going to come back. You're not going to succeed. Uh, look at these few verses. Jeremiah, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 17, 15 to 18. But the king of Judah rebelled and sent agents to Egypt to get horses and a large army. Will he succeed? Can he get away with that? He cannot break the treaty and go unpunished. As surely as I am the living God, says the sovereign Lord, this king will die in Babylonia because he broke his oath and the treaty he had made with the king of Babylonia who put him on the throne. Even the powerful army of the king of Egypt will not be able to help him fight when the Babylonians build earthworks and dig trenches in order to kill many people. He broke his oath and the treaty he had made. He did all these things and now he will not escape. That's a pretty clear message, right? Well, so what's Jeremiah pleading for everybody to do all this time? Cooperate. Yeah. Cooperate with the Babylonians. Behave huh? themselves. What? Behave themselves. Yeah, behave themselves, right. Unfortunately, to the military that were still left in Jerusalem and were trying to fight off the Babylonians, that sounded like treason. I mean, wouldn't, you know, if you really thought that you had a chance against the Babylonians and hear someone say, give up, surrender, surrender, you know, you would say, that sounds a little bit like treason. So what did they want to do? They to kill him. They wanted to get rid of Jeremiah. He wasn't supporting their side, was he? Look at Jeremiah 38. Uh, excuse me for reading several passages in Scripture, but uh, it's, it's clear the, the stories are so well put. Shephatiah, son of Matan, Gedaliah, son of Pasher, Jehuchal, son of Shelemiah, and Pasher, son of Malchiah, heard that I was telling people that the Lord had said, whoever stays on in the city will die in war or of starvation or disease. Okay, war, starvation, disease, okay? But those who go out and surrender to the Babylonians will not be killed. They will at least escape with their lives. I was also telling them that the Lord had said, I am going to give the city to the Babylonian army and they will capture it. Then the officials went to the king and said, This man must be put to death. By talking like this, he is making the soldiers in the city lose their courage and he is doing the same thing to everyone else, uh, to everyone else left, the, left the city. Well, left but, in the city, I'm sorry. He is not trying to help the people. He only wants to hurt them. Yeah. What, what's so prophetic about that? I mean, wasn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that have been the case? Whether, I that, mean, in those days, yeah. if you gave up, didn't you, didn't you live? Didn't you, I mean, mm, mostly. did Jeremiah have to be a prophet to, 
to say that. Well, what he was saying is that that's what God wants you to do. He doesn't want you to stay in the city and fight. He wants you to go out and surrender because this is the time to surrender. And they didn't like it. So they took him and dropped him down with ropes into Prince Malchiah's well, which is in the palace courtyard. There was no water in the well, only mud, and I sank down into it. Try to imagine yourself sunk in the mud. This, I'm sure this was a well at one point in time, but there's no water left there probably. Nothing but mud. A little bit of water, just enough to make mud. How would you like to spend your life, you know, sunk up to maybe your waist in mud? Does it sometimes look like God wasn't with Jeremiah? Because God told Jeremiah. <laughs> Because <laughs> God told Jeremiah, I will be with you through all, all this thing. Yeah. But a lot of it seemed like Jeremiah was on his own a little bit. Well, yeah, it, it, he preserved his life, didn't he? Yeah. It sounds like Jeremiah would have a right to conclude that God, God is abandoning him too. Yeah. Okay, now we don't have time. I wish we had time to do this. We, haven't had, we don't have time to look at the Book of Lamentations or to get all the details of what was happening. What was going on in the city for those two and a half years? Supplies were running out. Zedekiah couldn't have been packed too tight to th try and think he could get around the Babylonians anyway. Let me just read two or three verses. Jeremiah 19.9. <clears throat> the enemy will surround the city and try to kill its people. The siege will be so terrible that the people inside the city will eat one another and even their own children. How does that sound like a good meal? Mm. Look at Lamentations 2.20. Look, O oh Lord, why are you punishing like this, us like this? Women are eating the bodies of the children they loved. Priests and prophets are being killed in the temple itself. And finally, Lamentations 4.10. The disaster that came to my people brought horror. Loving mothers boiled their own children for food. That was, now, uh, that if you, was after they were dead, I would assume. They didn't yeah, kill probably, their children. Probably not. Um, but in that desperate situation, now here's, here's Jeremiah. He's in the middle of this. In that desperate situation, Jeremiah was pleading with people just to leave the city, surrender to the Babylonian army, and they would save their lives. It sounds odd he would be the only one preaching this message if it, if, if it was at that point. Well, what do you think the other people did if they were preaching, if they were believing that message? Getting out of there? They got out of there. Surrendered to Babylonia to the Babylon, Babylonian army. How large of a group is this? Like How large is the group? Yeah. Uh, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure anybody knows for sure. There couldn't have been more than maybe 20,000, 30,000 in that small city, but that's still a lot of people. Yeah. And because Jeremiah was facing all of this is why God had told him some years before, don't marry. And I'm sure that God, I mean, I'm sure that Jeremiah was, wanted to get out of there and, and just mm -hmm. go to Babylonians himself, but I think God probably told him, stay there, I need you there. Uh, to me, one of the great ironies of this whole thing is when Rome came and took Jerusalem, the same identical thing happened. Yeah. They never learned all of you. So, so what use of it was to have Jeremiah there? Didn't seem to do any good. Just That's became a kind of a question. became kind of a nag all the time. Well, all these people, what? <laughs> and, and nothing, nothing. It didn't seem to make much difference. So, twenty six hundred years later, we're studying his message. Have we learned anything? Not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. That's the question. Have we learned anything? I don't think loving mothers eat their children. Well, they did that for us from the Romans. I'm, I'm, I mean, then, well, I'm we've changed. You. I know, but I don't think today people, you know, are starving and they die. I don't give up and anybody cooking their babies. <laughs> Who does that? Well, <laughs> seems hard to those find. people That's right there. Low, there you go. Oh. Mm. Well, yeah. when I mean, when the when the children are dead, uh, mm. generally yeah. when you have any kind of cannibalism like that, it's because. Mm. You know, in order to stay alive, that's the only f that's the only nourishment that is available, and so that's what you do. And you know, I remember hearing um, people of the Holocaust 
uh, and other people in similar situations saying the ones who lived were the ones who determined they would do whatever they had to do to stay alive. Yeah. Well, Jeremiah is telling them he's going to die of what? They're going to die of war, famine, and disease. or disease. Well, when people are unhappy about a message, like the <clears throat> leaders were unhappy about Jeremiah's message, being received from someone that they are afraid might be actually telling them the truth. Kill the messenger. They can't convince them to stop saying it. What do you do? Kill the messenger. Kill the messenger. As if that could stop the message. Jeremiah had grown up within a few miles of Jerusalem and spent most of his life there. But like Jesus hundreds of years later, Jeremiah was not respected in his home territory. And what, what verses are we talking about? What did Jesus say? The prophet is in his own, in his own country, basically. Yeah, yeah. And look at, this is probably the most famous verse, Luke 4, 24. Jesus added, prophets are never welcomed in their hometown. That's my good news translation. Yeah. Well, when the military leaders reported to the king what Jeremiah was saying, the king, who didn't have any backbone at all, just to appease them, said, do what you like with him. And Jeremiah was taken and lowered into a more or less dry well in the courtyard of the palace where he sank down in the mud. What do you think they thought was going to happen to him there? Die of starvation, I guess. <laughs> they, they thought, okay, we're not, we don't have to kill him. We just let him die there. Well, fortunately for Jeremiah and for our cause, that wasn't the end of the story. Look at Jeremiah 38, starting with verse 7. However, Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch who worked in the royal palace, heard that they had put me in the well. At that time, the king was holding court in the Benjamin Gate. So Ebed Melech went there and said to the king, Your Majesty, what these men have done is wrong. They have put Jeremiah in the well where he is sure to die of starvation, since there is no more food in the city. So that gives you a pretty clear picture, right? Then the king ordered Ebimelech to take with him three men and to pull me out of the well before I died. So what's happened here? So someone comes and gives the other side of the story and the king says, okay, pull, throw him in the well. Okay, pull him out of the well. <laughs> what's he doing? He's, he he has, he has no backbone. He just, whatever, whoever's, you know, yeah. saying... Is, is his ear right at this moment? He's delirious from hunger. <laughs> well, he's going to be worse than that pretty soon. He got, they got some worn out clothing, which he let down to me by ropes. He told me to put the rags under my arms so that the ropes wouldn't hurt me. I did this, and they pulled me up out of the well. After that, I was kept in the courtyard. The king actually said, keep him here. And as we studied in previous lessons, if you remember... What did they do? What did the king do when things got really bad? He called Jeremiah and said, Tell me, what does the Lord say? What, what's going to happen to us? <laughs> Incredible. Well, how many prophets in the history of the Bible have had their lives threatened? All of them. Can you name some? John the Baptist, they got him in the end. John the Baptist had his head cut off. Any others? What were they going to do, with, just to mention some New Testament ones, since you mentioned John the Baptist, what were they planning to do with John and, and, and Peter? And then finally, Peter by himself. Yeah. And what happened with Peter? He's crucified upside down. Well, finally, but at that point in Jerusalem... Remember the angel came and just undid the things and he disappeared. Even though he was guarded in what, the two sixteen guards or something like that were trying to and he was he was actually chained to some of them? Gone. So can you think of any others in the Old Testament? Isaiah? Yeah, Isaiah was sawn in half, wasn't he? By uh, Manasseh. Very good. You're thinking of several of them. Okay. Well, nobody in our day could do anything like that, right? The church would never do, the Adventist church would never do anything like that, right? Anything like what? Sort of so, trying so. to get rid of a prophet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Ellen Wyatt returned from Europe and established her home in California in 1887. 
She recognized that there were problems developing in the Adventist Church. She traveled with the delegation from California to the Minneapolis General Conference session in 1888 and gave her approval and support to the messages brought by E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones. Now, in those days, it was, a, it was almost impossible to travel across the desert, like, I mean, across the, that western part of America, except by train. There were two or three train, rail, rail lines through to the east. That was the big thing. If you wanted to go east, you had to go on the train. So this, all, the whole Adventist delegation went in a single car. And when they got there and Ellen White started showing her support for these two young men from California, what did the people from the east say? I don't know. Tell us. <laughs> They'll ride back. <laughs> well, the church leaders from Battle Creek were very unhappy about what Wagner Jones were preaching, and they thought Ellen White had been misled by these two young men. After the Minneapolis meetings, Ellen White began to travel to a series of camp meetings around the East in the company of A.T. Jones. The two of them were emphasized the message of righteousness by faith and a correct understanding of the law which the young man had been preaching. All about Galatians 3, if you remember. Shortly thereafter, what happened? The General Conference leadership decided it was best to ask Ellen White to go to Australia. How many Adventists were in Australia when Ellen White was asked to go there? Not very many. Very, very few. A handful in New Zealand, but there was not yeah. many. She said clearly that she had had no revelation from God that she should go, but she went anyway, because the brethren had asked her to. They were hoping to get her out of their hair. Where do you find that? Oh, it's in her, what, this story? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's all, it's well documented in her writing. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you can, I'll show you, I don't, don't, I mean, I don't think I need to document that all right now, but if you, <laughs> it's very clear, yeah, no question about that. Fortunately for us, Ellen White used the time in Australia not only to build up the work there, which she did a fantastic job and under very difficult circumstances, but she also wrote Steps to Christ, Desire of Ages, and Mount of Blessing. Think of those books. How long was she there? In about 10 years. Yeah, and oh. If you saw some of the country that I know quite well, yeah. it's a wonder they got as far with what little they had to do it with. Yeah. yeah. It's miraculous. Yeah, they, they built schools in places where everybody said, that, that's, that's, that's junk land. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to, nobody should yeah. go there, and on and on. I mean, the, you read the story. Read her, her, her book, her six-volume biography done by her grandson. You get your eyes wide open. So now, um, she departed for Australia in what, 19? 1890, 90, somewhere right there. Came back in 1901. And she got back here, she says, it's time to transform things in the General Conference. We got a mess. There's few people in that Battle Creek headquarters that think they are supposed to be in charge of the whole world. Get rid of them. Yeah, it was. And that's when the General Conference was completely reorganized, basically the way we have it today. Well, going back to Jerusalem, when the wall of Jerusalem was finally breached and Jerusalem fell, what happened to Jeremiah? Went to Egypt. Ended up well, not quite yet. Quite You're a little ahead of the story. Look at Jeremiah 40, 1 to 6. The Lord spoke to me about Nebuz after Nebuchadnezzar, the commanding officer had set me free at Ramah. So Nebuchadnezzar was not actually right at Jerusalem. He was a little ways away at Ramah. And so when the wall was broken down and the last of the people were at, were, were, that were still alive were taken out of Jerusalem, they were taken to Ramah and presented before Nebuchadnezzar. And when Jer Jeremiah showed up, the somehow or other, I don't know how they figured out it was Jeremiah, I had been taken there in chains, he says, along with all the other people from Jerusalem and Judah who were being taken away as prisoners to Babylonia. The commanding officer took me aside and said, The Lord your God. Now, I want you to think, look at these words. Where did these words come from? The Lord your God. She, he uses the name Yahweh. Notice it's Lord, it's, it's in small caps. Yahweh your God threatened this land with destruction. How did they, what had happened just now? Just before this? The Babylonian army had conquered Jerusalem for the last time, right? But he says what? 
the Lord your God threatened the land with destruction. And now he has done what he said he would said he would. Who's doing what here? God. He's not. Why isn't he saying, we in our powerful army conquered the Jews? This guy's got it together. Yes. Amazing. All this happened because your people sinned against the Yahweh and disobeyed him. Amazing. Now I'm taking the chains off your wrists and setting you free. If you want to go to Babylonia with me, you may do so and I will take care of you. But if you don't want to go, you don't have to. You have the whole country to choose from and you may go wherever you wish. That's where, amazing. Where would this have been time-wise in relation to when Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind? It's difficult to know that for sure. Probably bef uh, that he lost his mind after this. Pretty sure. But we can't be sure. But there had to have been word in Babylon, you think back as far as Daniel in the furnace, the, the, the word was out somewhere that there was a God of the Jews. Yeah. I mean, but this guy, I mean, it's like this guy's almost a prophet. Yeah, he's got it all down. He's a Babylonian general. But when I did not answer, Nebuzaradan said, Go back to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the grandson of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylonia has made governor of the towns of Judah. You may stay with him and live among the people, or you may go anywhere you think you should. Then he gave me a present and some food to take with me and let me go on my way. I went to stay with Gedaliah and Mizpah and lived among the people who were left in the land. Of course, that's not the end of the story, but that's where we are right at this point in time. Amazing. Um, I have lots of questions about that. I mean, how did they know who Jeremiah was when he... I mean, here's all these prisoners looking like skeletons walking around, you know, and they come to him and all of a sudden, oh, Jeremiah, oh yeah, okay. They could have been searching since there were so many people f fleeing and word got out when they captured them. And well, I, I, I think that... I think that probably the people who were fleeing probably told them about Jeremiah, and that's how he knew at least who, about Jeremiah. But, I mean, I'm trying to think, how would you identify Jeremiah? Are you Jeremiah? Are you, Je <laughs> you know, how, how it... Yeah. It obviously had some way of identifying. Well, as we've noted before, Zedekiah, his family, and his high officials were caught after escaping from Jerusalem, and Zedekiah was forced to watch as his entire family and his high officials were put to death before his eyes, and then his eyes were gouged out. He was dragged to Babylonia, where uh, shortly thereafter he died. Maybe we should just read a couple of those verses. Look at Jeremiah 52, 6 to 11. Jeremiah 52, 6 to 11. On the ninth day of the fourth month of that same year, when the famine was so bad that the people had nothing left to eat, the city walls were broken through. Although the Babylonians were surrounded in the city, all the soldiers escaped during the night. They left by way of the royal garden, went through the gateway connecting the two walls, and fled in the direction of the Jordan Valley. But the Babylonian army pursued King Zedekiah, captured him in the plains near Jericho, and all his soldiers deserted, uh, deserted him. Zedekiah was ta taken to King Nebuchadnezzar, who was in the city of Riblah, in the territory of Hamath, and there Nebuchadnezzar passed sentence on him. At Riblah he put Zedekiah's sons to death, while Zedekiah was looking on, and he also had the officials of Judah executed. After that he had Zedekiah's eyes put out, and had him placed in chains, and taken to Babylon. Zedekiah remained in the prison in Babylon until the day he died. That's, that's what happens to Mr. Wishy-Washy. <laughs> well, uh, look at Jeremiah 29. Uh, remember that uh, things are not chronological in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, starting, here, I wrote a letter to the priests and prophets and the leaders of the people and to all the others whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken away as prisoners from Jerusalem to Babylonia. I wrote it after King Jehoiachin, his mother, the palace officials, the leaders of Judah and of Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the skilled workmen had been taken into exile. I gave the letter to so-and-so, we don't read all that. And his letter says, The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those people whom he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to take away as prisoners from Jerusalem to Babylonia, build houses, settle down, 
plant gardens, eat what you go in them, marry, have children, then let your children get married so that they also may have children. You must increase in numbers and not decrease. Work for the good of the cities where I have made you go as prisoners. Pray to me on their behalf, because if they are prosperous, you will be prosperous too. I, the Lord, the God of Israel, warn you not to let yourselves be deceived by the prophets who live among you or by any others who claim they can predict the future. And what were these? some of these false prophets saying? Remember, we studied some of them. It's going to get better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Two years. Babylon's going to collapse and, and, and all the people from over there are going to come back and all the temple treasures are going to be brought back. And what did Jeremiah say? The opposite. Seventy years. Seventy years. Did Joseph follow this kind of counsel? Why are you asking that question? I'm not quite sure. You mean well, I, back in Egypt? What, what we have is, is Joseph is in another country. Yeah, in Egypt. And he is contributing yeah. oh, I under see. his circumstances see, yeah. to, the, to the welfare of the country. Mm -hmm. um, it would be a good example, right, mm -hmm. for them at this point. What about, um, what about Henry Kissinger? Yeah. He's Jewish, mm -hmm. was. He was Secretary of State. Is that, yeah. it was he, could it be said that he might be doing something very similar? Yeah. And I'm not promoting yeah. Kissinger here to saying he did great things. I'm just saying I see somebody who is Jewish and yeah. who who might prefer to be in a in an entirely Jewish state, a good strong state, but he isn't, and therefore he contributes to the. Okay. Given everything you've heard so far, I'm going to ask you a philosophical question, which we, for which we don't have the answer, so you, now everybody's on their own. Do you think the, the people, the Jews in Babylon, were any more responsive to Jeremiah's message than the peoples back in Jerusalem? Not really. <laughs> well, what, they, what are they? they we've, we've, we've observed that Ezekiel and and the people down there in in that little place in Babylonia mm -hmm. were were hearing this, but is there any evidence that Daniel was hearing? You know, these other people back there in in Babylon were hearing that Jeremiah was saying these things. Is that I I, I, I think that's what you're asking. Yeah. Jeremiah actually sent this letter with someone who was actually took it to those people in Babylonia. So Daniel, Daniel probably did three may, friends. maybe not have heard it. No, Bab see, Daniel was serving in the government in Babylon right. itself. These people were some distance okay. away in a separate area of exile among the exiles. But the exiles heard it. Mm -hmm. They were they they heard it. Well, well what do we know about the further the later history of the Jewish people in Babylon and Persia, etc.? Well, what did they do? They were there for 70 years, and then an opportunity came to come back, and there weren't very many that came back. They just very said, hey, you know, we well, just stay right here in Babylon and Persia, and we're kind of settled in here. And in one sense, they were better off there initially than the ones that were left in what was left of Jerusalem, because all the tradespeople and builders and the fit, they went to Babylon. Okay, I want to read the last few verses of Jeremiah 20, or actually 10 to 13. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 10 to 13. And I want you to think about this. This is, we read over these verses, and some of them are quite famous verses, and we probably, we think, oh yeah, that's nice. But I want you to think of how unusual this was to the people who heard them for the first time. The Lord says, when Babylonia's 70 years are over, I will show my concern for you and keep my promise to bring you back home. So he's saying, I'm going to take care of you where? In Babylonia, right? I alone know the plans I have for you, plans to bring you prosperity and not disaster, plans to bring about the future you hope for. Then you will call to me. What's that talking about? Prayer. Prayer. Then you will call to me, you will come and pray to me, and I will answer you. Where at? Babylonia. 
in Babylon or Babylonia. You will seek me and you will find me because you will seek me with all your heart. And there's a famous verse, right? We've all heard many times, probably in sermons. So now, in order to understand how impossible those words might have seemed to the Jewish people in Babylonia, we need to understand that in ancient times, most of the people believed that gods were assigned to certain territories. It was believed that Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, only lived and worked in Palestine. Thus, praying to him in Babylonia would be a futile thing to do. But here was a message of hope and grace from one of the prominent prophets from Judah. And he told them to pray from Babylonia, and God would answer them. This must have been a real surprise to them. He wasn't hearing them when they were praying from Jerusalem. Why not? Because they weren't paying any attention to him. That's right. They weren't praying with all their heart. Now here's the here's the amazing thing. Look at Deuteronomy. Now how how long how how much time is there between Deuteronomy and Jeremiah? Hmm, you can, 12, 800, 12, 800, years. 800 years. Deuteronomy 30, 1 to 4, and I quote, I have now given you a choice between a blessing and a curse. When all these things have happened to you and you are living among the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you, you will remember the choice I gave you. If you and your descendants will turn back to the Lord and with all your heart obey his commands that I am giving you today, then the Lord your God will have mercy on you. He will bring you back from the nations where he has scattered you, and he will make you prosperous again. Does that sound vaguely familiar? Mm -hmm. Even if you are scattered to the farthest corners of the earth, the Lord your God will gather you together and bring you back so that you may again take possession of the land where your ancestors once lived. Which hasn't happened yet. Well, no, they. some of them came back. Would, Look at Deuteronomy. Yeah? I was just going to... Would the outcome have been different had they surrendered instead of being overtaken? Well, yeah, Ellen White says very clearly that if Zedekiah had marched out through the wall and said, I surrender, Jerusalem would not have been destroyed, the temple would not have been destroyed, people would have been allowed to stay there. Yeah. Just that they had been allowed to stay previously. Yeah, exactly. Well, look at Deuteronomy 4.29. There, this is in these places, you will look for the Lord your God, and if you search for him with all your heart, you will find him. Does that sound familiar? I mean, this is exactly the words that were stated by Jeremiah 800 years later. So much so that, and this is just one small example, there are so many precise predictions in the book of Deuteronomy about what's going to happen later, and they worked out just exactly the way God said they would, that many Many, many biblical scholars claim Deuteronomy couldn't possibly have been written until after the exile because not even God can predict the future. So there's no way Moses could have said this 800 years before because we know God can't predict the future, right? I wonder what Moses was thinking as he wrote that. Yeah. And what did they see? What are the people? These are sermons that Moses preached to them. And then he wrote them down. I mean, imagine Moses standing up there. He says... Here I have been working my lifetime. I'm 120 years old. I have basically given my life to get you here where you are. Now I can't go across the Jordan River because of the sin I committed. But I'm handing over to you. And now let me tell you what's going to happen. I think Moses must have been weeping. Well, but here's evidence very clearly presented in Scripture that God can predict the future and that the 70-year prophecy he gave to the people in Babylonia would also come true. So, why in the world did we have all of this? 800 years of hoo-ha when God knew all along it wasn't going to work. <laughs> Amazing that you should ask that. Are there and hasn't worked yet. Maybe there's you, something. I mean, you, you, which I says they, they, they haven't. You said, well, there were a few came back. Well, you know, a, yeah. a trickle came back. That's that's not, certainly can't be interpreted as the fulfillment of the prophecy of. Well, you know, why? Why all we, this? Why this tremendous history of, of everything about and. 
and counsel and guidance of something that's not going to work. There's a verse in the New Testament, which I won't bother to turn to right now, that says all these things happen to them, for example, so that we basically don't make those same mistakes. Hmm. I wonder why those stories are there. Anybody have a clue? <laughs> well, he never, he's never given up on them or us in these days. We amazing. And we're still doing the same has anybody thing? Not, had, has anybody not been making those mistakes? I mean, you mentioned a few moments ago about even in our own church history out of similar situations. Yeah. Are you sure this isn't, are we sure this well, we're, isn't, we're isn't a story to, to show that, well, it's never going to work? We're just going to keep going on making the same mistakes. Yeah. Well, it's a well-known fact that aliens, slaves, and exiles are not treated very well. Minorities often get treated as scapegoats if things go badly. This has happened right down through human history. But God promised these exiles that he would be with them and that when the 70 years were over, they would have an opportunity to return to Jerusalem and Judah. Did he fulfill the prophecy? Absolutely. Why 70 years? Why not 65, why That's not 40, a good why question. not 120? Is there, is there a significance to these 70 years that um, we know about or that we don't yes. know about? Or? If you're a careful student and read back through the history, you will realize that everything that God has predicted has taken place exactly as he foretold it. Some of his prophecies have been conditional. We recognize that. Is that history an adequate reason for believing his future prophecies? Okay, now listen to this. There are some interesting suggestions also in the writings of Moses as to why this period of 70 years was necessary. Look at Leviticus 25, verse 4. Um, you shall, I'm going to start with verse 3. You shall sow your fields, prune your vineyards, and gather your grapes for six years. But the seventh year is to be a year of complete rest for the land, a year dedicated to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not even harvest the corn that grows by itself without being sown and so forth. Do not gather the grapes, etc. You think you could do that? So you're saying if you're a subsistence farmer? You're saying this is a 70 years was a... It's kind of a sabbatical a, kind of a thing. Yeah. A long-term seven year? No, well, they probably gave them good crops <clears throat> in the sixth or somewhere along the line. And it's in, to me, uh, having grown up and seen something like this, before we got superphosphates in the Western countries, you always had a big chunk of your property fallow. They rotated it yep. so the land could come back, and yep. they still do it here and there. Some places. Yeah. Okay, listen, this is still Moses. I'm reading from Leviticus 26, 34, and then 43. Then the land will enjoy the years of complete rest that you would not give it. It will lie abandoned and get its rest while you are in exile in the land of your enemies. Hmm? This is Moses writing. First, however, the land must be rid of its people so that it can enjoy its complete rest, and they must pay the full penalty for having rejected my laws and commands. Did somebody know something was coming? Yeah. Think about it. Now, if you're a subsistence farmer, and I understand subsistence farmers, I think, because I spent 17 years in Africa. Would you trust God, after reading those verses, would you trust God to say, okay, it's been six years now. I'm not going to touch my fields for a whole year. And then you've got to pay tithe mm -hmm. on top of that. And church budget. Would that require a significant amount of faith? Yes. yes. Don't you wish we knew if many of the Israelites actually, there must have been some who actually did it and benefited. Evidence suggests that most of them didn't. Now God is saying, since you did not allow my land to rest, it will get 70 years of rest all at one time. Well, do we have any prophecies in Scripture or the writings of Ellen White to give us hope for the future? Does a correct and thorough reading of the book of Revelation provide encouragement or does it frighten you? The latter. <laughs> no, I'm wolf. Well, how did Ellen White feel about the progress of the gospel in her day? 
In a sermon at Lansing, Michigan in September 5 of 1891, just before leaving to Australia, we talked about that, she said, we are in continual danger of getting above the simplicity of the gospel. There is an intense desire on the part of many to startle the world with something original that shall lift the people into a state of a spiritual ecstasy and change the present order of experience. There is certainly great need of a change in the present order of experience. But the sacredness of present truth is not realized as it should be. But the change we need is a change of heart and can only be obtained by seeking God individually for his blessing, by pleading with him for his power, by fervently praying that his grace may come upon us and that our characters may be transformed. This is the change we need today, and for the attainment of this experience, we should exercise persevering energy and manifest heartfelt earnestness. We should ask with true sincerity, what shall I do to be saved? We should know just what steps we are taking heavenward. Was there a particular issue at the time that she was addressing here that you know of? Yes. <laughs> we already talked about it. <laughs> yeah. Righteousness by faith. Well, and I would say, I would go beyond even saying righteousness by faith. If you, if you read through Ellen White's writings at that time, and the way I did it is I read all of her, all of her Review and Herald articles and her Signs of the Times articles starting from 1887 up to 1893, 1894, and you'll just see the progression. And what you'll find is during that time, she went from talking about, you know, more traditional Adventist things about keeping the law and that kind of stuff to talking about righteousness by faith. But then she went beyond the righteousness by faith thing and started talking about the implications of the great controversy. She said some amazing things during those years about the great controversy. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we're running out of time. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the discussion. Did that prophecy come true? Well, Daniel was taken into captivity in 605 B.C., and Cyrus let them go, go back home if they wanted to in 535, and that's exactly the 70 years that had been predicted. For whatever reason, so few of the Jews went back home, and I hope that we will do better in our day. What can we learn from these lessons? Our kind and loving Father, may this lesson that we have studied together be a benefit not only to us who are here, but to all those who have opportunity to hear it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.